We've been waiting for the Mario movie for two years, and while the movie is exactly what it says it is on the box, nobody could have guessed Nintendo would even acknowledge Star Fox and Rob the Robot outside of Smash Bros. Oh, oh you've got to be kidding me! Let's go over that and what else you may have missed in the Super Mario Brothers movie. Wahoo! That is cinema! After the epic introduction of the King of the Koopas, we see an ad for the Super Mario Bros. plumbing company that they made themselves. When I saw this in the theater, I couldn't tell what was more mind-blowing. Seeing Mario in the Super Cape from Super Mario World, or hearing the theme song from the Super Mario Bros. Super Show. Thank you, Super Mario Bros. Did you know the lady at the end of the commercial is voiced by none other than Jeannie Elias, aka That Show's Princess Peach? Immediately after the Brothers plumbing ad, we see that they're in the Punch-Out pizza parlor, with headshots of Punch-Out characters lining every wall. These include series punching bag Glass Joe, Bear Hugger from Punch-Out on the Wii, and series protagonist Little Mac himself. Like any respectable pizza place, Punch-Out Pizza has a classic arcade cabinet in the back of the store. That game in question is Jumpman, a game bearing a shocking resemblance to the arcade classic Donkey Kong, which was the debut of Mario himself as the titular Jumpman. And the old man playing the game is voiced by none other than Mario's iconic voice actor, Charles Martinet. He even does a little Mario jump and goes, hoo-hoo! We learn that the Mario Brothers left their job at Foreman Spike's Wrecking Crew to start their own business. This is an unexpectedly deep cut. Wrecking Crew was a launch title for the NES alongside Super Mario Brothers, but it actually released one year prior on Nintendo's Japan-only arcade machine, the Nintendo Verse system. Foreman Spike would show up in the bonus stages and steal your paycheck bonus because you didn't find a randomly hidden coin, which I hope was a deleted scene that'll be on the home video release. Luigi was also playable in co-op, although he was sporting pink overalls at that job. I wouldn't be surprised if that helped motivate him to leave along with Mario. You gotta live by your true colors. You can tell a lot about a guy by what's in his room, and when we see Mario in his room, we see that he's a massive Nintendo fan. We see him struggling to finish the NES classic Kid Icarus, while an R-Wing from Star Fox sits atop his chunky CRT television. A poster for the NES game Kung Fu is one of several on his back wall. Posters recreating the box art for the NES titles Golf and Tennis can also be seen. Come on, Mario! Luigi's ringtone is the GameCube boot-up theme, and it's actually the first reference to something from the 21st century in the movie. This single-handedly proves that Luigi is the best Mario bro, because he's a man of impeccable taste, just like me. There are so many classic Nintendo references all over the buildings of Brooklyn, so let's rapid-fire them. We see the Duck Hunt Duck on the sign of a fancy French restaurant named Chasseau Canard, which means Duck Hunt. The Sunshine Travel Agency is a nod to the 2002 GameCube classic Super Mario Sunshine, with the dolphin on the sign referencing the game's iconic Isle Delfino. Castle Burger is designed just like the castle at the end of every level in the original Super Mario Bros. There's wall art of a deck of playing cards called Luck Cards, which is a callback to Nintendo's time as a playing card company back in 1889. The Blizzard Pop Shop features the polar bear from Ice Climbers, and the Car Wash features the main character from Balloon Fight. What might be the deepest cut in the billboards of Brooklyn is the Diskun Repair Shop. Unless you grew up in Japan or are a colossal nerd like me, you probably wouldn't know that Diskun was the mascot for the Famicom Disk System, an add-on to the Japanese NES that we never got in the States. Alright, I know the previous entry was supposed to be all about the billboards, but this one's special. The Euro Maker Shop isn't where you can grab a delicious Greek taco, but it's a reminder to one of the most important characters of Nintendo's history. Rob the Robot, which stands for Robotic Operating Buddy, was sold alongside the NES to market it as an incredibly sophisticated toy, as opposed to a simple video game console. This was following the great video game crash of 1983, and it was the right move in the long term. Rob would remain in relative obscurity until 2008's Super Smash Bros. Brawl, where he would lead an army of Rob Duke duplicates in that game's story mode, the Subspace Emissary. We've seen a lot of classic Mario enemies in the trailers, but there were a few that we didn't expect to see. First off, Biddy Buds. They're these adorable ladybug-like enemies that first debuted in Super Mario 3D Land for the 3DS. Next, we have the Bramball, a play on the words Bramble and Ball. And this cutie debuted in New Super Mario Bros. Wii. Depending on your history with the game, seeing Mario and DK get eaten by the Ma Ray was either a delight or brought back repressed memories from your childhood. First appearing in Super Mario 64, this eel has gone on to terrorize players in various underwater levels, but what really blew our minds was seeing King Boo, P.D. Piranha, and King bob at Bowser's wedding. King bob hasn't been seen in a mainline Mario game since Super Mario 64, and we even got to see his fuse get lit, which has never happened before. Although I'm not gonna lie, that hurt to watch. P.D. Piranha made his first appearance in Super Mario Sunshine, but might be best known for his appearance as an epic boss fight in Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Seeing King Boo gives me hope for a Luigi's Mansion movie in the future, as he's been the primary antagonist of that series since 2001. He's basically the bad to Luigi's Mario. 
We've got almost every Kong in the family. Donkey Kong, Diddy Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., Dixie Kong, Bluster Kong, Chunky Kong, Cranky Kong, and even Kitty Kong. They established that DK is Cranky Kong's son, which is in direct conflict with the established family tree. In Donkey Kong Country, it was established that Cranky Kong was the Donkey Kong from the arcade game of the same name, and Donkey Kong Jr. was his grandson that would eventually grow up to be the DK that we know and love today. The rocket barrels on DK's cart are pulled right out of Donkey Kong Country 3, but they became iconic in Donkey Kong Country Return on the Wii. Someone making this movie clearly loved those levels though, because DK and Mario use one of the rocket barrels to fly off to the final battle just like in DKCR. Several Kongs have a 64 on their outfits, calling back to the good old Nintendo 64, which was home to what could be considered DK's most iconic game, Donkey Kong 64. They even used the DK rap to introduce Donkey Kong. Although they did forget to credit Grant Kirkhope in the credits, they better fix that on the home video release. Before our heroes hit the road to rescue Luigi, they've got to customize their rides, and they use the select screen from Mario Kart 8 to customize their carts. It still blows my mind that we got an epic action set piece on Rainbow Road. They basically turned Mario Kart into Mad Max. But the biggest surprise from this whole scene was the blue-shelled Koopa Troopa. In Mario Kart, the blue shell item flies past everyone to completely annihilate the racer in first place, but we've never seen a Troopa with a spiky blue shell and wings until now. They basically put a kamikaze pilot in a kid's movie. I have no words. The Mushroom and Jungle Kingdoms were absolutely gorgeous, but it was a treat to see classic levels from across Mario's history. When Mario, Peach, and Toad make their way to the Jungle Kingdom, they pass by the iconic bob -omb battlefield from Super Mario 64. Considering this is where you fight King bob -omb, we really should have seen his cameo coming. Yoshi's Island was shown briefly in the trailers, but it was nice seeing Mario chomp on one of those delicious apples from Super Mario World. The biggest surprise was seeing Tostarena from Super Mario Odyssey as the Desert Kingdom. I really hope future sequels go here. Miyamoto's goal with this movie was to make the audience feel the same way as someone playing the games, and it shows in the animation. The platforming sections with a fixed camera are a clear indication of that, but they managed to include several iconic moves the characters have pulled off over the years. You've got Mario's wall jump, his ground pound, and he's even got his forward aerial from Super Smash Bros. Princess Peach can float in the air, just like her playable debut in Mario 2. Donkey Kong had his classic rolling attack from the DKC games, but did you know they snuck in his least popular move? In Donkey Kong Country, he could slap the ground with both hands to reveal secrets but in Donkey Kong Country Returns, it has changed to him blowing. Yeah, I can see why this didn't make it into Smash, but he uses it to put out Mario's Fire Flower. That's pretty lit. Bowser easily stole the show. It's clear that Jack Black was born to play this character, and that was before we saw him bringing his tenacious D energy to his music numbers. Did you notice that his piano was a Ludwig von Koopa original? That has some serious implications, considering that Ludwig is one of his kids, and the best one. Don't at me. His master plan to Mayor Peach is also perfection, ripped right out of Super Mario Odyssey. It's amazing that despite the 1993 disaster scaring Nintendo away from Hollywood for 30 years, this movie manages to homage it in a few unexpected ways. Mario and Luigi are still plumbers from Brooklyn that get sucked into the Mushroom Kingdom while trying to fix a plumbing problem, and the Mushroom Kingdom itself is in another dimension. Peach has a mysterious origin that involves her coming from another world, which is close to how it was for Daisy in the 1993 classic. Unfortunately, there wasn't anything involving a magic meteorite that sent the dinosaurs into another dimension, but that's what sequels are for. It's a bit of a cliche for a cute character in a kid's movie to be a complete doomer obsessed with the concept of death, but that's surprisingly fitting for the baby Luma that spends most of the movie caged up. Luma's debuted in Super Mario Galaxy, and their whole deal is that their purpose in life is to consume star bits and eventually fly off, explode, and be reborn as a new galaxy. Which means that across Mario Galaxy 1 and 2, Mario has canonically sent 28 children to their doom. But it's totally okay, he had their mom's permission. Okay, I know you missed this because everyone but me left the theater before even the mid credit scene. In the mid credit scene, you see that the shrunken Bowser is still allowed to practice piano while caged up, which is adorable. I hope he gets to release his album while incarcerated. But at the very end of the credits, we can see that the Yoshi egg offered as a wedding present made its way back to the Brooklyn sewers and began to hatch, leaving us with the iconic Yoshi. That's right, we're getting Yoshi. It's yet to be seen if he'll be a main character in the sequel or get his own spinoff. The latter would be pretty funny since he's in Brooklyn and the brothers are kicking into the Mushroom Kingdom right now. Maybe he'd live with Mario's family? Only time will tell. But thankfully, I'm patient and will happily re-watch this movie every day until the sequel arrives. Okay, I know there's so much more we could have covered, but that's not our fault. The movie's just that good and has so much to pour over. We'll definitely be buying the Blu-ray to gawk at every single frame. But what did you think of the movie? What was your favorite thing you noticed that we didn't have time to talk about? Let us know in the comments below.